And this is Postcards from the Underground by Tony Press. Again, this is Postcards from the Underground by Tony Press. The war machine was big and well armed, but it moved slowly. Jimmy and his cohorts were quicker. He mailed a postcard to his mother every Tuesday, rain or sun or snow. She responded as soon as she received it, never forgetting to insert a $10 bill into her envelope. She also included a written message, though not on stationery. Instead, her quaint penmanship filled both sides of a pale blue index card. She told him of her week, the garden, the bridge club. Unwritten, but always visible, was her prayer for his help and her plea for his return. She was at home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in the small brick house on Islington Street where Jimmy had been raised. Her husband, James Sr., working with his father, had built the house, completing it in September of 1940, six months after their marriage. It took some time, but Jimmy was born just after the war in March, 6, March, March 1946. Jimmy was now 21 and far from home way out west, bouncing between Wyoming, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. The words on his cards, cards which boasted brilliant color photos of vast lakes, roaring rivers, and snow-capped mountains, those words rarely deviate. Hi, Mom. Doing okay. I hope you are too. Jay. She read them twice, in case there was something she missed. <laughs> Always, too, printed in capital letters, a general delivery mailing address, perhaps the same as the week before, but just as often not. And the date, July 3rd, 1976, 1967, July 10th, 1967, July 17th, 1967, July 24th, 1967. A month with five Tuesdays was a good month. When his father was 21, he was a corporal in the army. Later, he worked for and eventually owned the first roofing, heating, and insulation company in Portsmouth. He died of cancer. Asbestos, they said, at the Veterans Hospital over in Manchester when Jimmy was 16. Jimmy would not be a soldier. He would never understand how his father, Ben, had, had enlisted, war or no war. Jimmy might do any manner of things, maybe even roofing, but he would never wear a uniform, never carry a gun. He hadn't been the greatest student, but he knew vocabulary, and when Miss McClure taught them nemesis, he knew exactly what it meant and what it did. There were schoolyard issues, and sometimes he and Rocky Soldavani were almost that, at loggerheads, a phrase his mother liked to use. But he had no real nemesis. Not then, not now, and certainly not across any ocean. He was not going to shoot another soul, whether in Vietnam, or Vegas, or Virginia, or, or anywhere in between, he had a single life to lead, and he would live it, not for his country, but for himself. But no, no, not just for himself, but for the entire world. Somehow, his job now was twofold. Firstly, helping others escape the clutches of the military, and secondly, key to the first part, avoiding it himself. If his mother were ever truly happy, he thought, it could only be a, a timid happiness. He wanted more. He was not going to scratch out days on a calendar, silent and stubborn, year after year after year, and then die the way his father had, the way so many did. He was going to live without apology. He would surely fall a few times, but that was to be expected with any real movement. Her latest pen message, this time in red ink against the light blue, delivered far more content than usual. Two cards, each one packed with writing, embraced and protected the Saba, his father's odd name for $10 bills, and, and Jimmy almost spilled his beard. A tall, cold Falstaff, when he reached this section. My goodness, Idaho. Your father served a year in Idaho, guarding Italian prisoners of war. He came home in 45, he swore he'd made a big mistake by enlisting. I should have been a CO, he said, a conscientious objector. He even told me he wished he'd been brave enough to do that. Imagine. And her final line, he'd be proud of you. 
doing what you're doing. Jenny was in Pocatello, working with a group of resistors in a town where such things were not done. In a few days, he's going to drive two guys up to the Canadian border, where they would cross and be met by somebody called Alex. So that probably wasn't his real name. They met once a few months ago at a college campus in Spokane, Washington, and had spoken via payphone on a weekly basis since then. In fact, Alex knew him only as Quincy, which was his father's real name, and not his. Jimmy sat long after Monday's midnight in a stained booth in an almost empty dentist. The sole waitress was leaning against the counter, talking music with one of the cooks. Soon, a series of temptations hits forward from the jukebox. He fiddled with a packet of sugar, but did not open it. He touched his dying cigarette to a new one, inhaled deeply, and sipped his coffee and began the postcard with the mail before noon. Hi, Mom. Mom. There's so much I didn't know. If I ever get back, I have so much to ask. I love you. Jimmy.